Welcome everybody. So we've got the last presentation here in this room for this conference. And so I would like to welcome Sam. Please make him feel welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along to the last session before the fun lightning talks. So I know everyone's exhausted, and um, we'll see how this goes. Um, so I will say, it's not on the slide, but I do actually work for Google, and this is somewhat my job. So I, I feel humbled that I can come to LCA and talk about that kind of stuff. Um, hopefully, it's an interesting talk about things that actually are quite open. Uh, we think the web is a very open platform, and we think that's very nice. Um, for a quick show of hands, who is a web developer who's developed a website? You know, HTML, Doctype. So not everyone in the room, actually. So that's actually kind of interesting. Um, most people know what the web is, I suspect. Um, you may have used it to get here. So um, the talk is, the web is, the the web is dead, long live the we uh, web, which is a bit provocative, of course. Um, let's talk about a brief history lesson. Um, so basically, this is what the web looked like in the 90s. Um, this is actually a site I made for a, a conference a few years ago that was intentionally 90s themed. Sadly, it's not a GIF. Otherwise, you'd see a lot of things flashing right now. Um, so the point of this was really to show that this is how the web started, right? It was this kind of crazy place where people made really dumb looking things and it was very um, open and everyone could do whatever they liked. And that was fine, but it was a bit of a burden in that. It was a lot of cost. Um, what we evolved into is things like Ajax. Um, and of course, Ajax is why we have the web as it is today. Um, this blog post is from, and it's just hard to read on the screen, but it's from 2005. Ajax was, Ajax was obviously around before that, but it was sort of like, oh wow, everyone can use this. It's pretty cool. A website is no longer the static thing, it's a very dynamic thing that does something interesting rather than just showing you pure content. And that's fine, right? We kind of split web, web things into two kind of categories right now. We've got web content and we've got web apps. You know, web content being like a newspaper or whatever. And we've got things like web apps, which are really like Google Maps or, or equivalent kind of things. Google Maps is, of course, the most iconic web app. It's not really content. I mean, it is, but you don't access it in any, in any kind of traditional sense of the word. We've also got things like Slack these days, where you use Slack and you honestly forget that it's really just a web browser. Um, it's even more pronounced when they ship it in things like Electron, which is just a web browser. So at the same time, we also developed these wonderful things like Django, which kind of commoditized the web. Um, it made the web a place that you could write a lot of content very quickly. Um, it, we went from just having uh, simple, you know, brightly colored websites to having these things that you could run and install and suddenly have a framework to write a ton of content or you know, share it with other people. Like maybe this is like a wiki or something. So this is another thing that we had that was really kind of a nice part of the web that we have evolved over the last you know, 15, 20 years. And of course, you know, I have to actually include Google Maps as an example, right? This is what it looks like. Um, and the question I have for you all is, you know, do you think of using Google Maps as a website on your phone? And who has done that? Okay, so a few people. Was it out of necessity or did you like doing it? So there's not a lot of noise there, right? Like some people like it, but fun fundamentally, what happened to the web was mobile happened, right? This is why we thought the web was dead. And you've guessed from my title that I want to propose to you that it's not dead. But mobile is a thing that happened. Um, I've been informed that there's an app for that. It may actually be a trademark, so I hope I will attribute whoever uh, has trademarked that correctly. But this is basically what happened. We had this culture of you had to get a native app to do a thing. You know? And part of that was those native apps had access to things like uh, special bits of hardware or um, magical device APIs, which did way more than you would expect from a desktop. Um, quite fundamentally, you know, we started having apps because web pages didn't know how to get, get your location data. They didn't know how to do um, compass heading or, or things like that. Um, native apps let you do files. They let you do a lot of cool APIs that were very proprietary. You know, Apple. And Android, too, brought up these wonderful ecosystems where you could write super interesting things with tons of options. And this is why there's an app for that really became a term that maybe it's not said these days, but it was a popular term for quite a while. Um, and we kind of know this. Um, I could put a graph here, but we kind of fundamentally know that mobile has overtaken desktop. You think of anyone new starting to use a computer or a technological device, um, not just in the first world, but even in the third world, you know that their primary interaction with that kind of device or with the internet as a whole is going to be on a small screen. You know, you ask anybody the classical question, if you only had to have one computer for the rest of your life, what is it going to be? And you know the answer will be someone's phone. Of course, there's some debate about how big that phone needs to be these days, but it'll be fundamentally a phone. So we know that that's the primary way that people are now discovering the internet. And this is kind of what happened. And this headline is from Wired in 2010. Um, if you read the abstract, this is I linked to this already, so you might have read this article. But they basically said, the web is dead, 
Now we just have the internet, and that is a commoditized thing that um, you access through proprietary applications. But what we see is that zero apps get installed per month. And of course, how is that possible, right? Like, um, zero is not, you know, less than one. I do have apps on my phone, but this is basically rounded down. Um, you know, this is obviously Google stat, and we use the statistic in a, in a bunch of places. It's not from our data, I will say, but we often repeat this, this figure. Um, at best, we can find one app per month, right? To give the, the argument credibility, right? People do install applications on their phone. You know, they go to a Play Store, they go to an App Store, they download them. And of course, there's different patterns, right? People will like download a lot to start with, and all the numbers come out in the wash. But fundamentally, people just don't install apps. And if you're um, a brand new thing, a brand new bit of content trying to push your product or service or whatever, the, an app is not necessarily going to make you win big. Um, we have some other stats too, right? Um, you know, 78% of time is spent in a, in a user's top three applications. Um, does anyone want to guess what they are? Actually, yes, a web browser is often one of them, but it's usually not the one we think about. Any other? Yeah, Facebook, no prizes, sorry, it's pretty obvious. Um, yeah, also owned by Facebook, but still fundamentally, it's Facebook, Instagram, maybe Maps, or some other thing they do commonly, maybe like, you know, WhatsApp or some chat application. So we have the stat saying that, you know, even though people have a lot of apps, they predominantly use a couple of main apps all the time. And as Katie pointed out, web browser is sometimes one of them. It's usually pretty high. There's a similar stat, which I haven't put on these slides, which show that 10% um, of people's time is, is in a web browser. And that kind of makes sense, right? Um, it's still pretty low, but it's where people get a lot of different content. Another stat that I haven't put here is that uh, people tend to stop using their new applications after about, sorry, 70% uh, of people, which is a convenient figure, which is about the same as this, um, stop using an application after three days. So even if you get on someone's home screen, if someone's gone through that burden, um, and this is not what the talk's about, but it's an interesting stat nonetheless, that most apps don't get reused. And so the fundamentally, the things I've kind of told you here are because of this barrier. Um, this is not a lemon, this is actually the Firefox emoji for the sweaty face. Um, apparently Firefox OS made a bunch of emojis before they died. And fundamentally, um, these, are, these, these, these buttons on sites are kind of a brick wall to users' experiences. And these are the friendly versions. Think of the very egregious buttons when you're navigating your, on your mobile phone of web, websites showing entire interstitials saying, please get our application. When I don't really care, right? Fundamentally, I just want to get at the thing. I want to get at the content. Um, you know, we all know this is annoying. And probably some of us have built these things because we're told to, we're, we're asked to. We have to pitch our company's application or whatever. And we're told to put that interstitial saying, we really want to drive tra traffic to a mobile app. What's the best way to do that? I know, let's be really annoying. And the flip side of this too, it's not just about a barrier of getting people to click that button and go to the Play Store. Um, fundamentally, the way, the way apps are built, the model for, for native applications on your phone is this, right? Um, iOS, Twitter, and I didn't list Twitter actually here, I'm sorry, is about 200 megabytes. Android Twitter is about 70 megabytes. And I'm not fundamentally against that, right? Like I use the Twitter app on my phone, it's not a bad application, but it preloads all the use cases that I might ever want out of Twitter. It can't preload people's content, of course, that's all photos and whatever, but it preloads all of that code and logic and behavior um, and whatever else it needs. But what we see on the right here, this thing called the PWA, which I haven't actually defined yet, but let's pretend that I have, is fundamentally the website version of Twitter. And this is what we, where we go to mobile.twitter.com. This site, from loading to posting a tweet, downloads less than two megs. And most of that is my friend's photos because I, the first thing I see is the stream and it preloads a bunch of photos. So if I had no friends, it would be even, even smaller, which is great. It's good to know that I have friends, which is nice. But fundamentally, the, the, the flip side here is that I'm not preloading use cases that I don't care about. I'm only getting what I want and I'm getting it fast. And while 200 megs is not even that much of a burden in the first world, think of the third world, think of places that are developing, think of places that have poor network connectivity and that's pretty rubbish, right? So fundamentally what I'm trying to get across here is if you are developing something and it's for other humans to consume, which is the content, or other humans to, I guess, consume and use, like an application, my argument to you is that the web is the most open platform we have. Every device we, we have in our pockets can serve this content, can use the content, and it really is the easiest way to share anything, any one thing with anyone else without any of these high barriers to entry. And one thing I want to really highlight is that the reason native apps have picked up, and I mentioned this before with the kind of, there's an app for that, is that this is the traditional view of the web. Um, we had this idea that the web reached a lot of people, that 
you could access it anywhere, just, just work through a simple URL. And you know, for the longest time, you know, if, we are, if you're an early adopter of the web, that's something you're used to. And then we were told, we can actually have this app which has a ton of capabilities. And that's something that we have on, the, on a native app, although the reach wasn't as high because you had to have a certain platform and you had to install an app. But this really this is what I want to pitch to you today is that this has really changed. Um, we're now really in an age where the capabilities of the web have actually caught up with its reach, which is kind of what I think is really exciting and kind of what the meat of the talk is. And this is what I want to talk about today, the sort of things you can do on the web that you maybe don't expect you can do or that are you know, new and shiny. And this is kind of what I was saying. I want you to build better websites. Um, the, capabilities, the capabilities we have have caught up with the web's reach. And fundamentally what that means is things like native APIs and also performance. Um, web browsers of 10 years ago were much slower than we, what we have now. Um, anecdotally, I was told a story that Chrome at Google was actually driven by the docs team who struggled to get their JavaScript running for their real-time editor in Firefox. And of course, Firefox and Safari and everyone always, always plays an amazing game right now. You know, browsers are amazingly fast and I'm not gonna say that Chrome is the fastest, but this is one of the driving desires behind Google building Chrome in the first place which was fundamentally a faster JavaScript engine. We also have this amazing evergreen browser space. Who has to support IE 11 in their jobs? Okay, a few hands. Any earlier than IE 11? Some, some, some muted hands. Um, if you're lucky, you can now support things like Edge, Firefox, Chrome, and Safari, and these are all functionally evergreen browsers. They get updates, but you can still serve the old content to old browsers. They'll just see it, it'll be a bit weird, right? That's how the HTML works, we kind of know that. So it's kind of the midpoint, right? What, what's old is new again. Um, the points I made before were really, you know, when rounded down, when you approximate that, no one wants to install your application, right? That's an uphill battle that it's really hard to fight. And it, sure, if you're a next new trendy social application and you manage to get users to install your app, that's great. But that's not 1% or even less of people. So building an app is often wasted or at least um, difficult work for you to do. URLs still mean something. And of course, then the final point is, the web is not dead. So how do we do this? So as part of my job, um, we'll talk about what I do briefly. Um, I'm what's called a developer programs engineer at Google, which kind of means I have approximate knowledge of many things. Um, part of my job is to give talks like this and write samples and libraries, but I'm all across a whole bunch of things. So I write things like polyfills. I have an interest in emoji. It's a whole different topic that I could go on for a long time. I also work on a thing called Santa Tracker. Who's heard of Santa Tracker? Yay, who's used Santa Tracker? Who's put their kids on Santa Tracker? A couple of hands, people have kids. Okay, that's great, I'm glad you like it. I can't design anything, so don't, I didn't draw anything here, but we make it happen. The reason I'm mentioning this site is because Santa Tracker is one of these things we talk about that I sort of hinted at before, which is called a progressive web app, or a PWA. And I'll explain more what a PWA is in a second, although I do wanna show off this slide because it has a few of the games we wrote this year, and they're pretty fun. So this is my self-indulgent slide. So if you like um, Ski Free, which is the top game, I mean, legally distinct from Ski Free, to be clear, um, or you like a game where you parachute into a land and then try to um, throw snowballs at your fellow elves until there's no more land, which is a kind of subtle reference to a popular game last year, then you can actually go and play these games right now. Um, this is quite well received, and these are both games that work well on mobile, although the videos are from desktop, you can see the mouse cursor, um, and will actually work offline really well, which I'll get to in a second. So what is a PWA? I've hinted at this idea. A PWA is really a, a, a website that has app-like properties, and this is a made up term, I'll get to that in just another slide, but what that meant for Santa Tracker is that a whole bunch of our users who used our website accessed that website through an icon on their home screen. And that's pretty exciting, right? Because I built this website, of course it works well on mobile, it has a responsive design, but fundamentally when people used the site, they didn't see a URL bar, they didn't uh, know it was a website, and it actually worked offline really well. Um, some things didn't, our YouTube videos couldn't be embedded, but we hid those things from the UI. So this is an exciting you know, whole site, which is very complicated and interactive and something we actually build at Google that um, works like a real application. And as a web developer, hopefully that sounds appealing to you because you've built all this, done all this work, you've spent all this effort, and we actually got um, quite a lot of users out of this mobile experience. And it's something like um, 10 to 15% of all eligible users on Android loaded our application through this icon, which for us is really amazing, right? Because there's a few steps to get there but those were our most engaged users who really wanted to come back every day and use this thing, not caring whether it was really on the web or not, but it managed to meet, it meant that we could reuse all that work we went to. So as I said, Santa is a PWA, and this is kind of the segue. This is a made up phrase. If you haven't heard it before, 
Um, it's literally just a conversation piece. It's a thing that you build. Um, as an engineer, I can say it, it totally doesn't mean anything. It's totally just random words. Um, it's not a, it came from a good place, but it has a couple of benefits, right? It's obviously good to search for, and it's good, to th it's good as a thing to tell your manager, investor, boss, whatever, that this is a thing you're investing in or spending time on. Um, and this is why we want to you know, define it as a concrete thing that you can think about. And as I mentioned before, um, a PWA is fundamentally, there's a lot of definitions, but for me, it's a web experience that has an app-like feature set. And as we saw, Santa Tracker has an icon on the home screen. This is the thing you expect out of an app. It also loads when the internet's offline, which is the thing you expect out of an application. It can also do more things that I'll kind of get to in a little bit, but basically we're talking about things that you would normally expect only a native app to be able to do through those APIs, which, as I mentioned, have now really come to the forefront. There are things you can use on the web now that match things that were um, previously only available to native proprietary ecosystems. So fundamentally, a PWA is made possible by this thing called a service worker. Um, it's a JavaScript script which runs in the background of a page, and it's actually supported quite well. We're quite excited because just a few days, days ago, um, Apple released their iOS beta and they support Service Worker now, which is really great for us. Because for us, Google being the sort of inst instigator of these features, we can now very proudly say that this thing that you build, this PWA, will actually work well across essentially all four major browsers. And that's really important to us. Um, and I have to say, I've been doing my job for the last two or three years, and we've been going, oh, yeah, Apple will do it sometime. We hope it'll be great. Um, and now I can legitimately stand here and say, yeah, everyone's on board, so this is lovely, right? So the things I'm talking about are real things you can do on basically every mobile platform. And hopefully the derivative browsers like um, Samsung browser and UC browser, which are basically just Chromium-based, also pick up these features. And we see that they take a little bit of time, but they pick up the same features as well, and they're also very excited. Um, Fundamentally, the service worker is a script that lives behind your web pages. Um, it's a singleton, right? It, 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 it runs a bit of JavaScript, and it essentially outlives the lifecycle of your site. So your user loads a page, they do some stuff. The service worker will hang around and um, listen to events and respond to things. And I'll explain how that works and what it can do in the next few slides. This is kind of the only buzzword I have in the whole, phrase, the whole talk. This is the way we describe a service worker publicly. We say it should have, or PWA, sorry, it should be fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging. I think what happened was someone thought this would be a cool uh, word to use for an acronym, and we made it fit. Sadly, I actually want to order them the other way, but let's start with fast, because that's what's first on the list. So to be a PWA, we want to be these four things, fundamentally. Fast, some more stats. Um, depending on who you ask, between 20% and 50% of people will abandon your site if it takes more than three seconds to load. Um, this is a pretty common idiom. We're all bored, we're all distracted. There's a squirrel over there. Um, and so this stat's really important, and it's super important if you're trying to engage with someone. We already have this burden of not installing applications. So if you're on the web, don't do yourself a disservice and take too long to load. Um, just while looking this morning, I was looking for a great article about, some articles about you know, new sites, classical examples of, of sites that are bad at this. And so I kind of tried to redact which site this is, but um, the title is Why the Web is So Slow and What It Tells Us About the Future of Online Journalism. Who wants to guess how long this site took to load? Uh, someone said 12. You're actually spot on. Um, oh, it was actually, no, sorry, it was 15 seconds. I ran it a few times. It was once 12 seconds, once it was 15 seconds. So this, this page, to get the content, and the content's not even on the page, right? It's down below somewhere, took um, 15 seconds and 11 megs of data. I will give this, this, this site some credit. Um, the content did appear really fast, but things were still moving into place um, for about 15 seconds. So um, a user may not load it, although they could have actually probably accessed it a little bit before that time was up. So this was kind of the irony here. Um, you know, I, I, this, I could give a whole talk on why ad networks are, you know, I work for an advertising company, but fundamentally I could give a talk about how some ad networks and some craft added to sites are obviously, obviously gonna slow down your load times. Um, it's a whole different time and place for that kind of talk. But fundamentally, this is what's happening. They wanna add a lot of stuff to, to do value ads, but all I want is the article, and it's not even on, the front, it's not even on this visible screen. Um, fast is pretty obvious, so I cover that pretty quickly. Now we get a bit more technical. I want the sites to be integrated. And what that fundamentally means is what I was talking about with Santa Tracker. So it may not be obvious, but this slide deck is actually a website that is a PWA. So this is something I, I spent way far too long on compared to actually writing a talk. So um, that's why there's not like crazy slide effects or anything like that, which maybe people appreciate. But if you add this thing to your home screen, it literally has a picture of my head and a little title, which is great. So 
This is a thing that a PWA can be. It can be integrated. It can have a, a definition file which tells it how it would appear on a user's home screen like this. Um, and it also kind of means accessing native hardware, feeling like it's integrated with the platform. But the thing we want as people who write content or applications is to be on a home screen, right? That's a valuable thing for anyone who builds something. I want someone to think about my, my thing constantly. So I'm kind of talking about web apps on my home screen. Is, how is this possible? Um, I kind of, people often call this add to home screen, but what we really mean is prompt to add on home screen. Um, because of the web, as I mentioned before, with the, with the Twitter example, for instance, fundamentally what we're talking about is progressive enhancement, getting more features, getting the features that I want, and not the features that you know, I have to download initially or, or as an initial burden on my users. Right? I want to browse to something and get something as part of that as the user experiences my site. And so we have a few metrics, but fundamentally, if you do the right thing, what will happen on these types of sites is if you, you tick all the boxes after, at least in Chrome right now, after two loads, we'll actually show you this message. We'll say, hey, um, it looks like you like the site. Would you like to install it to your home screen? And this has been super valuable for us, right? Because we get a lot of engagement through that. People click that button, and then the user gets an icon on their home screen. Um, and you know, I could talk about a bunch of other case studies, but for us, at least, building Santa Tracker, which obviously is a fun site for kids of all ages, um, as I said, we had a lot of engagement through this button. People would click that button and then come back to us regularly. Um, and those users were our most engaged users by that, by that application link on a home screen. So this is what you want to see. And if you, you see this, like, I guarantee whoever is um, paying your wages will be very happy. You do this through, the, through, a web, through a file called a web app manifest. I won't worry about it too much right now, but it's a file. It's got a bunch of stuff in it, as you might expect. Um, it describes how your app looks like when it loads. So we show a loading screen very briefly because Chrome or whatever takes a while to spin up. Um, Safari, I think, will do the same thing now they've, now, now they've built the same features. Um, Edge, for instance, on desktop, do a similar thing as well. They take some of the properties and turn it into a somewhat consistent home screen while we wait for a, a HTML engine to spin up and render, render a page. Um, there's a bunch of properties here. I can cover some of them. <coughs> Fundamentally, I can ask a few things of, I can define a few properties about my application that starts from a home screen. I can say, you know, what is its theme color, which is the color at the top? Um, what is its name? Pretty obvious. Do I want to be in a certain orientation, landscape or portrait? And actually my display mode, which is probably the most interesting one. Um, the thing people want and the thing you can choose is whether you have a URL bar or not. And in my case, for building Santa Tracker, we didn't want to have a URL bar. We wanted this to feel like a real native application that had no um, way to navigate. But for many people, they don't really care, right? Like you can load in a browser or what looks like a real browser um, as long as the icon is there on the home screen. And this is just a choice you can make. You can even go actual properly full screen, which on Android includes hiding the back button. Um, we don't really recommend you do that unless you have a real extreme use case like writing a game, but some people do like doing that. Uh, my favorite site is a thing called Progressive Web Flap. So who likes puns? No one. No, very coughs. Okay. Um, but my favorite site is a site called Progressive Web Flap, and as you might expect, it's a Flappy Bird clone that's on your home screen, and it uses full screen because, yeah, it's a real game, right? It shouldn't feel like a website. As I said, integrated also means using modern APIs where possible, right? Um, we've got things like payment request APIs, other media APIs. I won't go, go into these into too much detail, but fundamentally the thing to remember is that um, one of the reasons we're slow on some of these things and why these things have taken a long time is it's hard to get consensus. Um, Google has tried and, and, and other companies have tried to push proprietary API, APIs onto the web, and I hope this resonates at, at a Linux conference, but all those APIs have typically failed for a bunch of reasons mostly because they're hard to maintain, and we end, up, we end up diverging quite a lot from what those APIs set up to do. Um, one of the reasons I can only stand here now in 2018 and say the web is a great place to build software is because we've done a lot of legwork on committees, on whatever, to make everyone agree on how to do open web standards. And so web payment, uh, sorry, payment request API is a web standard. You can ask users for money or their credit card, works pretty well. <coughs> and we're only there because we've spent quite a few years you know, being on standards bodies, negotiating with the right people to get everyone to agree to implement it. Um, with a caveat, actually, that Apple has a slightly different version that uh, is mostly compatible, but we hope they will get there. So a really common question I get is, why can't I access a user's contacts from my website? And this is, yet again, one of those examples of something we can't do just yet. Um, I would suggest some workarounds if that's something you're interested in doing in your website, but I think it's one of the things we haven't got consensus on yet between the browser vendors. So the next thing in our fire point is reliable. And this is probably the most interesting point technically. 
So this thing I mentioned, the service worker, lets us handle and intercept all network requests. Fundamentally, as I said, it's a JavaScript file which can proxy all the network requests made by your site. Um, it only gets installed after a user first loads your page. So you load a page, get some resources, and you get this thing called a service worker. And this is essentially a proxy. It lives between the site and the web. And I can do whatever I like in this proxy. So I can return any, any file I like, any content I want. So installing it is pretty simple. <coughs> Use some APIs. I say yay. And this is probably the most interesting slide, is that when I get a, a network request, and this is just the way any proxy would, um, I can basically say, is this a certain URL? If it is, reply with some made up response, which is usually from a, a cache or something that I've stored locally. Or I can respond with the, network, with the actual network request. Um, this line at the bottom is actually totally optional. If I don't do anything, then the network request will be passed through to the network just like you'd expect. In re the reality, and this is how this talk is written actually, is that um, you can, uh, you, there's a standard convention for using a built-in cache. So we have in the service worker a, a, a place to put a bunch of web content, which is pretty standardized. So most service workers will look like this. You load a site. It'll handle the install event, which is fine to the service worker when a page is um, added to your home screen, or in fact, even when it's just loaded in the browser. That's, that to us is install. Um, it'll run a bunch of code, like caching files aggressively. And then below, when we have a fetch request, we can say, and the syntax is a bit weird if you haven't seen JavaScript promises before, but essentially what all this does is opens the LCA talk cache, uh, tries to match the request. If there's a response, returns that. Or if not, then I go to the network. So this is basically how a lot of websites are doing this now. And this has a bunch of benefits, right? <coughs> Not only if you're offline, but these files are now permanently proxied on a local machine. So if you, you know, are in a slow connection or a slow area, then this page will load really fast. If I reload the page right now, it takes no time at all because it's actually loading entirely from my cache. And I've kind of hinted at this, but um, the thing I find really cool about the service worker is that it's not prescriptive. It's totally imperative. Um, you can proxy your requests in any way you like. Um, you can go to the network, you can go to the cache, you can even race the request. You can say, well, I'm going to race the disk and network. Hilariously, we've actually found that the network is a lot faster in some cases. <coughs> um, we can also generate fake images. I haven't got an image as an example, but one reason people would do an imperative request that handles, that returns a, an image, for instance, is let's say I'm, I'm offline, but I want to show a dummy profile picture for someone's user profile. I could generate that in JavaScript, but I could also generate uh, proxy which listens for that URL and returns a fake image. And this is something that you can totally do. And if you're interested in the different ways you can use Service Worker, um, one of my colleagues, Jake Archibald, has got a blog post on it. It's a long talk, yet again, I could spend 45 minutes on this, and we often do. And those imperative things then beget strategies, right? Um, you can think about sing single files as caching them or, or going to the network or whatever. But I could, you know, cache everything for a static site. I could cache uh, just the core HTML and assets, and obviously the articles might change, so I want to let them fire out to the network. Um, the Guardian does this cute thing, which we off often cite, which is if you're, off you're offline, it gives you a crossword, which is kind of cute. Uh, you can cache some things and indicate what's missing, which is good for wikis, because the content's not changing very much, so you want to be able to access whatever you can and gray out links that aren't there right now. Um, and also maybe generate new HTML as requested. And this is kind of what I was saying. Um, the reason why this is so important for, for this fire analogy is because um, being offline is something that people expect from a native application, right? Um, no one has gone to their browser when they're on a plane that doesn't have Wi-Fi and said, I'm going to go to Google or whatever, right? But as soon as it, that icon is on your home screen, people have an expectation that these things will work. So this is why it's really important to do something and come up with a strategy of how your site's going to work, what it's going to look like, and how is it going to feel for the parts that you can't maybe cache offline. Um, you know, most people have dynamic content. How do I present that? And you know, how do I cache most of what the user wants so it feels nice? You know, this is often what we call the app shell. And how do I fill in the blanks for stuff that I can't get access to because I'm on a plane or, or underwater or something like that? So quick demo time. I'm just going to you know, put my money where my mouth is and actually drop out of full screen if I can work out how to. That, that's how. I'm going to turn my Wi-Fi off. Yay. And turns out, actually, this is really unsurprising. I just reload it, and it works. Um, so this demo was way less exciting than I thought it would be. Um, I also have a handler called foo, and what this actually does is, as well as uh, freaking out my slide deck template, is, come on foo, where are you? Oh, here we are. Oh, no, no, sorry. 
Nope, nope, nope. All right, this demo is failing. Let's pretend I was on localhost. Yeah, so I'm not running my server either. But this is essentially a really boring handler, just to show that you know the, the handlers are imperative. That literally returns a fake response after two seconds. So it incredibly adds a delay. Um, so yet again, just showing off that service workers are imperative. That's just code that generates generates dynamic dynamic content for us. So back to the slides. So the last point. Um, Engaging. We want sites to be engaging. And what that kind of means for our point of view is push notifications. Um, this is super controversial because these are really annoying. We know that. Um, and we've released this feature to the world where now literally every website, if you go in Chrome, is like, I would like to send you push notifications. And you go, go away. Block. Um, but we think when they're done well that they're really valuable to users. Um, to get a, get, get, get again, give a little bit of a live demo, you can see that I've got a, a so engaging message that appeared up the top there right now when I hit that button. And to show again how service workers actually work is if I close this, actually close this tab, which is yet again a scary thing to do in the middle of a talk, and I click here somehow. No, where'd it go? Oh, this talk's off. This is all bad. Um, no, I want to see the thing. Where does it go? All right. We might have to punt on that. But I want to show that I can interact with that, with that notification even when the site is closed. Because basically it's not uh, using my site to actually do anything, it's using the service worker under the hood to say, you know, when I click on it, open a new page or respond to something or do something interesting. So that uses a service worker again because the, the web itself is going to push the service worker and send the notification even without the site being awake. And it's pretty simple. In the service worker, I literally handle the push event um, and I will do something with that push event. There's a little bit uh, of work to do with setting up push. This is yet again one of the teething problems we had from moving from a purely Chrome-based uh, thing that we built ourselves to an open standard. Um, to I would basically, if you are interested in doing web push for your sites, whether they be full PWAs or just this thing you're working on, um, there's a bunch of libraries out there which will help you. There's a thing called Vapid, which is an encryption, me encryption mechanism, which basically means that uh, different vendors like Mozilla and Google can both uh, support the same clients talking to them, pushing notifications to their clients. Because yet again, these things work across all four browsers right now. Oh, actually not Safari, but everywhere else. Uh, you know, we have this kind of checklist for push notifications, which I'll kind of cover very briefly. Um, we want to be timely, precise, and relevant. A bonus if you're doing push notifications is to make them actionable. What that means is on your Android display or in my demo that failed, um, you'll actually get a list of options of things to do when you get a notification. Um, this is really basic psychology, but we find that if users have an action, have something to, to, to you know, notify a thing. Um, I have a camera at my house which tells me when someone's walking around or like I have a burglar and whatever. And it actually says, is this a person, yes or no? And so that notification is actually prompting me to do something with it. So this is something we want you to encourage you to do if you do use this tool, which of course we know people don't really like that much. Um, push notifications are a hard challenge and we're kind of working on uh, the better ways to surface this and to show that off to people. So um, that's the bulk of what I want to talk about in terms of PWAs, but I want to briefly cover some other random stuff that the web can do that maybe you didn't know about. Um, I always love this demo, which uh, will use my camera to you know, show off the fact that this is just a thing you can do on the web. I can put my camera anywhere I like and do something with that. Um, I love the orientation demo, but it doesn't quite work. I've got to go to sensors and pretend like my phone is like upside down, and then I will also turn upside down. So on a phone, this works really well because you rotate the phone and the image sort of follows you around the screen, which is quite nice. But something people don't, don't know they can do. We also have this great API called WebShare. Um, this is basically a, a thing in your, in your website where you press a button and the native OS will take over the sharing intent. So um, this should be a GIF, and I don't know why it's failing, and I, I, I'm a bit confused by this, but um, Pressing this button will show a little pop-up saying, do I want to share to Twitter? Do I want to share to Facebook? What are the apps I have installed? So it's a good way to integrate your mobile site, whether it be a real PWA or it has an, a URL bar, um, to feel like it's more part of the system, which is quite nice. It's one of those native APIs we haven't had before. I've covered Web Payments API a little bit already, but fundamentally it's not that different, right? You make a request, um, the payment application, which might be Google Pay or, or Apple Pay or whatever, will return with information to that page so it can make a transaction happen. And turns out, one of the benefits of native app stores has always been making money, and we want to help people do that on the web as well. We've also got a sort of a laundry list of other native APIs that we find kind of interesting. Um, in SantaTracker, for instance, we use geolocation, but we actually fall back to GeoIP most of the time. 
we found that actually, even though Santa Tracker is literally a site where Santa, showing you where Santa is and how long it'll get to your house, people would not say yes to the I would like to know where you are button. And so for us, we found that the best thing we could possibly do is to use GeoIP. Um, GeoIP works, works best in Western countries where there's more IP addresses, basically, and Santa Tracker tends to be used more in Western countries. So we're very happy with that. Um, we could say that you're in Sydney and that Santa has a few hours to get to you before you need to go to bed and get some presents. But we do, we haven't done this yet, but the plan is at some point to have a button saying, oh, this location, is this data not quite right? Click this button. And then we know that uh, the user gets to upgrade that experience. They get to improve their experience by enabling an API, which would give you, you know, more fine-grained data about the user's location using the geolocation API. Other things, we've got WebGL, we've got WebUSB, Web Bluetooth, Web Audio, um, everything starts with Web. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you can do right now, and each one of those points could be a whole talk in themselves, but my, my message to you is that if you want to do something that you've traditionally thought of as only being available on Android or iOS as a native API, the chances are there is some analogy or some facsimile that's on uh, the web now, and we think that's really amazing. Um, finally, I will not finish this talk without saying that Santa Tracker, which has been my example, is actually open source. So if you want to go check it out, you can do that. Um, the version there is not actually the one from last year just yet. It's on my to-do list for some time in the next few weeks, but it's the one from 2016. We did, however, make a video series about how we did it and a few interesting things that you might find uh, interesting if you do want to look at the source code and um, go and build it yourself. So we have a few examples of how we did things and why we did things in certain ways. Um, there's a few more resources, some attributions, um, but uh, turns out working for Google, I can just say go Google for things. So these are my suggested things to look, to look for. And the link at the bottom, Service Workers, is a site by Mozilla, which contains a ton, a ton of different, uh, really well annotated examples of how things work in Service Worker land. Um, you know, you can do a push, you can do an offline, and every example they have has a great breakdown. It's got three files, and you know, each section of the code is annotated. So I find that a really great way to learn how to do offline things or push things if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, and that's it. Um, so yeah, thanks for paying attention in the last talk of the day. And if any questions, I think we're going to run. Someone's going to run around with a mic, or you can chat um, them out. I am. I'm just caught up in my chair. Um, uh, um, I can tell you how the API works if you are curious. Uh, the question was, what's Santa's IP address? Um, uh, it turns out it's, it's a, um, a Firebase storage bucket, which is a Google Cloud storage bucket. Um, uh, I won't. I, I guess we are recorded, but I can tell the story. Um, we really pushed the limits of Firebase this year. Um, they were like, oh, no, we won't hit the quota. It'll be fine. And then, no, we totally hit the quota. So uh, I think it was something like two or three terabytes of data we've served. And they were like, oh, that's, that's a big number. Um, other question uh, back here? I'll come up to you. Thank you. And that's another five minutes, right, on top of that? Oh, great. So if service workers are running code when your tabs aren't open, how do you stop naughty service workers from burning all of your resources? Um, they can only live for a little bit. Uh, so the question was, how can I stop service workers from burning my resources if they're running when my browser's not open? Having recently experienced the, the joy of a, of a site mining Bitcoin um, in my browser, which was quite an interesting experience, I will say, um, service workers are event-driven, so they can only live as long as they're handling an event. And I think there's a timeout on that. So um, they're not a script that runs forever. JavaScript, fundamentally, as we know, is asynchronous. So um, it has to uh, be a thing that you, when you get a fetch or, or an install, you can basically say, please keep me open until I'm done this work. But we have a timeout on that as well. So you can't keep it open forever. Um, and that's how I mean, you know, the offline stuff works the same way. The, the, the browser will spin up the service worker even if the browser is fundamentally closed. Like on Android, if I get a notification, the Chrome will start in the background. It'll launch the service worker. It'll handle the notification, and then it will go away. So it can't stick around and do things longer than it should. Um, uh, um, you showed that web share API. Does yeah. that work with existing devices? Uh, yes, it's part of Chrome. Um, I think it's only Chrome only for now. <coughs> but it's, um, I think it's in Chrome 61, this public release. So that's pretty recent. Um, uh, it's only supported on Android for right now. But uh, when the browser is implemented, it won't take um, like it'll work anyway, the browser will run. So I think uh, Microsoft and Firefox are also doing it on the, on the desktop. But the key for us really early was, was mobile first because some of the stuff I mentioned, sorry, the question was where, where will WebShare be available or, or how it will work? 
And yes, it's Chrome only for now, but it's a good feature. We like it. More questions? Uh, yeah, hand over here. I can repeat or you can... Oh, no, we might as well, yeah. I need the exercise. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so the functionality to add to home page, yep. is that an API that's being standardized? Uh, yeah, it is. So um, it's standardized basically through the thing called we call the web app manifest, and that's a standard thing that describes how an app is on your home screen. So that's every vendor will implement that a little bit differently, but fundamentally you say how you want it to happen, and then each vendor, vendor being, oh, sorry, um, vendor being you know Google or, or Mozilla or whoever, will decide when to show that prompt or something like that prompt to, to prompt the user to install to add to home screen. Um, this is why the terminology is confusing, right? Because actually iOS has had, had add to home screen since the first iPhone, right? But what we really mean is prompt because no one presses that button, right? No one knows to go in the menu and say, oh, I want to keep this on my home screen. You've really got to ask users. Okay, and then uh, if you're on Android and you've got like multiple browsers installed, yep. can you does how do, who specifies which browser runs the PWA? That's a good question. Um, fundamentally, um, what's happening when you, when you add that icon to your home screen is we are launching Chrome, right? Um, uh, you know that icon loading my, my my talk when I load it on my phone, even though I can't see Chrome around the edges, I can't see the URL bar. It is that browser. So. Um, for Firefox or, or whatever, they'll load that browser and maybe hide the, the, edges, the stuff around the edges. And Edge, for instance, on the desktop is doing a similar thing, right? You, you will, I don't think they've launched their, their, their support yet, but on desktop for them, you'll click the icon, which looks like a regular Windows application, and it'll load in a window that is run by Edge, and that's because th that's what generated it, but a user shouldn't have to care too much. Um, so that part's not standardized, right? The way it's added to the home screen is, is vendor specific. I guess maybe it answers your question. We do have a little bit of time if anyone's got more questions. Cool. Uh, if not, then that's great. And uh, thanks for listening, and I hope everyone likes enjoyed it.